how in the world do you transition out of that and go into the message? Well, that's our challenge today, and that's our task. And so I want to just begin our time together going into the Word this morning. Um, we're going to a message called Decision Day. So if you picked up a bulletin on the way in, you may want to get your pen out and get ready to flip through your Bible, or we'll have uh, verses of Scripture on the screen. They'll be in the outline there. Uh, decision Day. Every spring, um, you see the decision day process that takes place when, when high school athletes who have done very well for themselves find themselves in a place where they've gone through a process of, of uh, being recruited by a variety maybe of colleges, uh, different schools, especially the really good athletes. They've been recruited, and there comes a day when, when they sit down at a desk. Now, y'all seen the pictures, right? Maybe some of y'all have been there. Maybe you've been the one who sits down at a desk, and there's some paper work, mom and dad's in here smiling like a long-tailed cat, got a coat standing over here, right? And, and the newspaper's there, or if it's a big deal, they might have it on ESPN, but decision day is a day when that person is saying, I have considered all of this, there's a lot of different options available to me right now, and I have decided that I'm going to take my talents, and I'm going to play football, baseball, basketball, whatever it is, for the <laughs> University of, well... For Spartan to go to Carolina, but I don't know. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Except when they play UVA, but anyhow, that's another story. Hush, <laughs> right, we're supposed to be in the lower town. Yes. <laughs> decision day. We're, we're making some decisions. I want to say to you this morning that, that, that you, sitting there right now, maybe not in the same context, but you're facing your very own decision day. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Last week we started a series of messages throughout this month of November where we're talking about broke. What does it mean to be broke? Why are so many people broke? What is a broke lifestyle? Well, we said last week that nearly 60% of Americans are living the lifestyle of paycheck to paycheck, or, or maybe even worse than paycheck to paycheck, we're having to pay the bills to buy the groceries or to put the gas in the car using the credit card and using, using credit to be able just to survive. And listen, man, I'm not here. If that's where you are right now, I get it. There are lots of different situations that cause lots of people to get into those places. But what I'm saying to you is that when we're living that broke lifestyle, we're missing out on so much. When we're living that broke lifestyle, we have no ability to save for an emergency that is going to happen. But more than that, when we're living that broke lifestyle, man, we're spending every dime. See, it's not always the case where I just don't make enough money. Single moms in the room, man, I get it. My heart goes out to single mothers who are working two jobs and three jobs and, and working to provide insurance. And you hear a guy like me talking and you're sitting there saying, what does he know? He doesn't know what I'm doing. I don't know. And I get it. And I honor that. What I'm talking about is when we choose to live a lifestyle where instead of understanding that everything that we have God has provided to us, and so we consume everything rather than investing. And so last week we talked about the difference in, in being a person who is a manager instead of being an owner. And church, when you get this concept that God owns everything, and He looks into our lives, and He allows us to manage the resources that He gives us, it is a totally new set of lenses, a totally new perspective. And we can look at our life with it. And what I want you to hear this morning, regardless of where you are financially, listen to me now. God loves you. God has a plan for you. And if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're up in the middle of the night stressing and worrying about all these things, God wants you to hear this morning. That's not His plan for your life. His plan for your life is to be fulfilled. His plan for your life is to be a person who enjoys the life that He's given you. But decision day means that there has to be a decision. And so here's where we're starting. Um, my future will be determined by my decision. Some of you say, yep, that's true. I'm living in what used to be the future because of decisions I made a year ago, ten years ago. I'm living in this reality and I wish I could change it, but you can't. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 16. This is a passage that we read last week. He says, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. Um, 
If you find yourself living a, a broke lifestyle, constantly upside down, then you've got to realize, number one, you're not alone. You've got to realize that today is decision day. Am I going to choose to serve money? It's not what I was created for. Or am I going to choose to serve God who can provide everything I need? Well, that's what He wants us to see. Here's the thing that we miss out on, man. Money, money is an excellent investment tool. You get this? Money is an excellent investment tool, but it is a terrible God. Money, we said last week, money was created to do what? Money is a tool. It's not a God. Why do we worship the tool? The tool is used. God gives you the tool so that you can do what? Well, He doesn't give it to you so you can spend it all. He gives you the tool so that you can invest it. And so that's where we're going this morning. When we try to make money a God, and we, we worship this God, Jesus says, look, you've got to decide. Your life either has to be about getting more money and more stuff and, and accumulating and trying to live a comfortable life, trying to have a life full of pleasure. You can do that. You can go all in with me. And you may not be able to see it right now. And it may be scary. You may be thinking, well, what's God going to require of me? Is God going to want my stuff? Yeah, He does. Let me just put it out there. He does. He wants your stuff. He wants your toys. He wants your money. He wants your heart. He wants your passion. He wants your body. He wants your life. He wants your future. He wants everything. And when you step into those waters of baptism, if you've done that, you know what you said to God? You said, God, I'm surrendering. I'm pushing all the chips in. You paid the price. Your blood on the cross paid the price for my sin. You purchased me. Now you owe me. And I'm all in with you. And the decision that we have to make is can I trust God with the money that He has entrusted to me? A better question would be can God trust me with what He's given to me? Money is an excellent investment tool, but it's a terrible God. Well, I want to go into a story this morning, another one of the stories from Jesus, and it's a story about a man who made the wrong decision. And I love how God had men to write down stories and preserve them through the years so that you and I could learn from other people's mistakes and maybe decide to not have to get there. And so the man in the story has made a decision that he's going to serve money rather than serving God. Here's where we go. Write this down. The decision to indulge greed is a gateway decision. You understand what I mean when I say it's a gateway decision? We get this, man. A uh, gateway drug, marijuana. We say marijuana is a gateway drug. If somebody starts smoking a little weed, no big deal. But the next thing is not enough, and now I'm doing something harder and harder and harder, and now my life has fallen apart. Well, the decision to indulge greed is a gateway decision. And when you look at your paycheck, every week or every month or whenever you get paid and you look at it and your first thought is, oh, all right, all of this is mine. What am I going to do with my stuff? And you forget that your stuff is actually God's stuff. And if you're his kid, now listen, 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 I'm, I'm talking to people who are followers of Jesus. If you've never said yes, yes to Jesus and you're not following him, you've not put yourself under the, the rule of Christ, that's another thing. You're, you're, you're living a different life. But if you're following Jesus and you've given your life to Him and you've accepted His sacrifice, He's saying to you, He gives you that paycheck. He owns it all. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to manage it? And when we as followers of Christ begin the whole thing with, I'm going to use greed and I'm going to get what I want, and not only am I going to use mine, but I'm going to try to get yours and use that too, that's a gateway decision. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. Someone... And the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And if you keep reading, you're going to miss something here. But, but a man cries out to Jesus. Jesus is talking to a crowd, walking through a place, a bunch of people there. A man sees him, recognizes Jesus. He places authority on Jesus because of the way that he cries out to him. He says, Hey, you look like somebody who knows what you're doing. Give me a little help here. I received this huge inheritance, my brother and I. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now remember, greed is a gateway decision. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said, well, watch out. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to answer your question, but I am going to tell you this. You need to be careful. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. 
Because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What's Jesus saying to this man? He said, I don't know the whole story here, what's going on, but just what you've told me right now, you've got a brother, and you and your brother are at odds because of what? Because of money? You're going to potentially ruin a relationship with your brother? Your brother, the person that God put in your life to walk through this life with you, you're going to put that in jeopardy because of money? Jesus is saying, watch out. And some of you in this room right now have been the victim of failed business ventures and, and relationships have been shattered and money got in the middle of that and messed things up. Some of you have experienced this thing where a loved one died and the family went all to pieces. Man, I want Aunt Bertha's vanity. Well, I used to sit at that thing and play with my Legos. Well, it's mine and she left it to me. Well, you take it. I ain't seeing you at Thanksgiving. Huh. How'd that work out for you? Was the vanity more important? There have been nights that you've laid in bed thinking, why did I go to that extreme and I killed a gnat with an atomic bomb over what? Am I tracking with anybody here? Or maybe that's just my twisted little life. I don't know. Anyway, anyway. Um, last week we heard Jesus say to use money. The smart Christians, followers of Jesus, use money to help people. Too often... We use people to chase after money. We get it all jacked up. Well, the problem with the inheritance and this man getting at the inheritance is it probably meant a large sum of money. And a large sum of money to him meant in one way comfort and extravagance and all that stuff. But, but what he probably doesn't realize is gaining this large sum of money is going to create another problem and that problem is more. It's going to create extra. The extra in my life demands a decision. You've not thought about this. But the extra in your life demands a decision. Okay, alright, I know I've got these bills coming up this week, and thank God, man, my paycheck for once in my life was more than my bills. Hallelujah. That's a good day, right? But what's that do? That demands a decision. If I'm a follower of Jesus, and I have extra in my life, it demands a decision. The first decision as a follower of Jesus, I'm just telling you, the first decision I'm going to make, I'm going to pre-decide before I get paid how much we're going to invest in what God's doing. So I've already baked that in, but if i still got more left over after that, then i got another decision to make. <coughs> do, I, do I spend the extra on more stuff and more comfort and more experience? Or do I say, God, you own it. I'm here to manage it. How can I use the extra in my life to do your work? Huh. The extra in my life demands a decision. And so Jesus uses this opportunity. So the guy spoke up. That's a real story. Now Jesus is going to go into a parable. Remember from last week, Jesus often talked in parables. Uh, throughout the course of Jesus' ministry, there's somewhere around 37, 38 parables that he spoke in. At least 11 of those he talked about money or wealth or worldly possessions. He talked an awful lot about money because he knows that money, wealth, possessions has a way of tangling up our hearts, getting us off base from where God wants us to go. So for this man who struggled with this inheritance thing and greed, Jesus turns it into a parable. Look at verse 16. It says he told him this parable. The ground of a certain <clears throat> rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Man, what a problem to have. I mean, he's already rich. <clears throat> he is already rich. He's already rich and now he's planted crops and these crops are coming in and it looks like, my goodness, the corn just won't keep putting corn on the thing. I mean, it just keeps coming in. The wheat keeps coming in and the stuff keeps coming in. My barns are already full. What am I going to do? It's already full. Wouldn't you love to have the problem of the bank call you say, look, 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 you've got so much money in our account, the vault won't even hold more money. Oh, well, let me go down to the other bank that's got a bigger vault, and you fill that one up too, and your stocks and your investments, and, and everything's going so well. What a problem to have. So you realize that my extra demands a decision. I'm going to have to make a decision. And too often, man, our desire for more, our desire for extra is going to lead us to a place where we're looking for more comfort in our lives. Raise your hand if you'd like to have a little bit more comfort in your life. 
Yes, I would too. That's why I'm just steadily shopping Target right now. They've got this, they've got this memory fold pillow. Have y'all seen this thing? Like instead of waking up after my head's been laid like that, it'll stay solid all night long and my neck don't hurt. I am in high pursuit of that thing. Yes, I am. Kids might not be able to eat in the lunchroom this week. They might be making peanut butter, but give me one of those pillows. <laughs> anyway, watch out when comfort starts coming into the picture. My desire for my comfort is the beginning of my demise. I don't even like preaching that, man, but it's so true. My desire for my comfort is the beginning of my demise. And so here at Compassion, we often talk about the four arrows, and the arrows stand for seeing the lost saved and the saved free, free restored, and the restored fulfilled. Everybody says, yeah, 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 I want that fulfilled life. I want that fulfilled life until we understand that Jesus says, oh, really, you want that? I want you to have that. I made you for that. How do I get it, Jesus? Give me that fulfillment. <clears throat> okay, well, you can have it, but you're going to have to surrender some things. You're going to have to let go of some stuff. Fulfillment means that, that, that you're, gonna, you're not going to have time for a lot of the stuff. You know, that couch and that TV and that remote control and that stuff. You might not have as much time for that. That, that chasing after a, a, a lake house or that, that comfort, all of those things. God says, I've created you for fulfillment. And fulfillment means that your life is aligned with the mission that God created you for. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all these things. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's the Great Commission. And God has called us to that. And when you dial into this thing that God wants you to, to, to have a passionate vertical relationship with Him and a passionate horizontal relationship with the people in the world, and you realize that, that, that people in your life are so far from God, people in your life, people you know are hurting, people in your life are struggling, and they're looking to all kinds of places to find comfort, to find peace, to find hope, and you know that you found it with Jesus, God is saying, hey, would you just go and maybe be an example, be a witness, maybe share what you've experienced with them. And when you do, and your life, and your life rubs off on other people, and you experience a kind of fulfillment that you've never experienced before, you know what that is? It's addictive. It makes you want more of that. How can I invest more so that I can get more of that? But my desire for my comfort is the beginning of my demise. Have you ever met anybody that had sat back in the lap of luxury for an extended period of time, had the yacht, had the planes, had the stuff, had the, all of that stuff, but had no adventure in their life? You ever heard somebody say, man, I know, I got all of the stuff and I've done all of the things, but I'm bored out of my mind. I don't feel like I'm making a difference. We were created for adventure. We were wired for greatness. We were designed to be helpers. And that's where God wants us to point ourselves towards. But we rot away. We rot away in the prison of our own comfort. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You rot away in the prison of your own comfort. And so, in verse 18, Jesus goes on with the story. He says, then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. These barns are already full. I'm going to tear them down and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat. Drink. And be merry. What has this man done? He has created a world where he is God. And in his little God universe that's his life, he has become God. And he is provided and he is protected. And in his little God life, he's seen every situation that could come. <clears throat> and he has determined that if I have more, if I have buffer, if I have enough, then I can protect myself against anything bad that could happen. Until you realize that you are not God. And you cannot control things. So he says to himself, take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. Sounds great, but is it really? 
Now, I realize that we've made a huge swing here. We started all this off by talking about not being able to have enough food to buy great value crackers and milk this week, right? Yeah, where are my great value people? Come on, somebody. Uh, they got in by that great value at half price instead of the Velveeta the other day for the cheese that needed to be made. Come on, man. Turned out just fine, I'm just saying. We started talking about buying Dr. Thunders in great value, and here we are talking about taking trips on yachts and sailing around the Caribbean. What's, what's the thing? What, what are we doing? Well, in, in some ways, it's the same problem. And the same problem is it all comes from a place of I want more. And I get it. Now, let me just say this. I get it. Some of you are living on a very fixed income. I'm not talking to everybody in the room. But for those of us who, who have a certain amount of means and we constantly spend up all of our means on stuff, why do we do it? It's because we want more and more and more. And it's because we're trying to put comfort into our life. But we do this thing that we put me in the center of our lives and me in the center of my life says, praise me, comfort me, make me feel good. And I pray for you right now that you've not engaged in a life where you have attempted to make yourself God because that never, ever works out well for us. See, the problem is I have to realize and realign that God is the creator and I'm the created one. And as the created one, <clears throat> He has every right to tell me this is what I want you to do with your life. And I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to give you a job. And you're going to make good money. And that good money that you make, I want you to use it because there are other people who, who are in different places who don't have the opportunities that you have. So invest in those people. Help people. Invest in places where, where the gospel is being spread, where hope is taking place. That's what God is saying to us. We're created by Him. But broke, broke, broke comes from a mindset of chasing more, more, more. And I know what it feels like to be left empty-handed from all of that. And a lot of us in this room do, uh, do too. So what happens with my extra? Well, my extra will eventually leave me and it will ultimately cost me. My extra will eventually leave me and it will ultimately cost me. Look at what Jesus says. In verse 20 he says, But God said to him, You fool. You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. You've tried to arrange this life where you're protected, this very life, you're gonna, this night, you're going to die. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? He says, you fool. <clears throat> Man, no, none of us want to be called a fool by God. What's a fool? Well, a fool is someone who just completely ignores practical wisdom. Wisdom is something that's tried over and over and over. This works and this is what's going to happen. And when God tells you over and over and over that this is the way to live a life that leads to fulfillment and fulfillment leads to joy and joy leads to the relationship with God and praising Him and you're doing what you're created to do, the fool says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to chase after whatever I want. I'm not giving up any of my stuff. I like my stuff. God says you can because God's always a perfect gentleman. He's never going to force himself on you. He'll let you do that. But it's a very foolish thing to do. So what happens? You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. You know, it's, it's almost as if we don't see God's side of this. And as a father, God's looking at his child. He's saying, man, I've taught them all these things I know. I've taught them all these things that they need to know. And I've tried to help them to not have to go through all of this stuff. And I love them so much. And I don't want to have them to have to go through that junk. But they're bound and determined they're going to go through it. I wish you wouldn't be a fool, is what God's saying to us. But the foolish person has completely ignored God. And God's saying in this instance, this very night, he's going to die. What's going to happen when he dies? Huh? What's going to happen then? What will happen to him? What will happen to his stuff? Well, his stuff will soon be squandered by people who didn't work for it the way he did, who didn't invest in it the way he did, and don't value it the way he does. It will soon be squandered. His stuff will be gone. What about him? Well, I hate to tell you this, but because his whole focus of his whole life was pointed and going in the direction that he wanted to go, chasing after things that he wanted, and completely ignoring the God who loved him, he completely rejected 
the life that Jesus had for him. And hell is a place that has been reserved for those who have said to God, the perfect gentleman, I want all of you to be in my family. But not all of us will accept God's will for our life. And hell is a place for those who have bound and determined, decided, I'm not going to have a relationship with Jesus. They've got to have somewhere to go. And because they've ignored and rejected God's Son, Jesus, even after Jesus has done everything He could to have a relationship, a connection, a life with them, they have said, I don't want you, Jesus. I'd rather have hell than to have you. A person who's following Jesus has a close relationship with Jesus and is listening and is leaning in and is investing in the things that have importance to God. When I focus my finances, or when I focus, where I focus, excuse me, where I focus my finances has an impact on my future. Jesus finishes the parable by saying, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. And so Jesus concludes with a very stern warning to each of us. It's decision day. Decide to follow Christ or decide to chase after money and whatever comes with it. Here's the last thing I want you to see. The, the decision to focus first on God's kingdom instead of my kingdom sets everything else in my life in proper order. Why is God telling us this this morning? Because He loves you. As your heavenly Father, He created you and He loves you and He knows how finances, the desire for wealth, the desire for comfort, the desire for possessions, all of those things have such a way of pulling us away from Him. Does God not want His children to have any fun, to have any stuff? That's not what He's saying. Look at Matthew 6, 33, a completely different passage of Scripture. What does it say? Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Righteousness is Jesus walking around perfectly loving every person that He went to, not encumbered by the things of the world, but living a perfect life where He perfectly loved people and He perfectly loved the Father. Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus said the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay His head, doesn't have, a, doesn't have clothes to wear. Foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but Jesus didn't even have a place to live. And He says, seek first God's kingdom, and you're going to have more than what you need, more than what you want. You're going to have a fulfilled life. Say, Jeff, how do I do that? I have no idea, no frame of reference for that. What does it look like to seek first His kingdom? Can we talk real practical for just a moment? If we continue, go back to last week, I'm just convinced that my role in my relationship with God is to honor this thing of God is the owner and I'm the manager. And so whatever He gives me, I'm just telling you, this is my thing, it may not be your thing, but I believe one of the most honoring things I can do to God is to say, God, whatever you provide to me, I'm going to make up my mind ahead of time. I'm going to pre-decide. Our family has pre-decided that, that this is what's coming in the next paycheck, Lord willing, if nothing changes, this is what's coming. This is what we're going to set aside, and we're going to give this amount away. Pre-decide. Each one of you must determine in his own heart what he'll give. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. I'm going to set aside first. Seek first the kingdom of God. First, first money we're going to spend, we're going to pre-decide that it's going to God. And that's just a principle. And I've seen it over and over and over how God blesses when we honor Him as the owner and I'm the man. And I'm saying, God, how can, I, how can I use the resources you've given me? Not just a, a percentage of it, but how can I use all of it? God says, now you're starting to get it. Now you're starting to get it. See, so many of us live in this world where we, we see ourselves as the owner and God's just one of the, the, the pieces in the circle of our life and we tip God just like we tip the waitress. But God says, it's all mine. So what I'm saying to you, start with a mindset of God, you own it all. I want that fulfilled life. I want to invest in the things of you. I want to, I want to worship you. And I want to help your people. Last week, I gave you a challenge. And that challenge was to start off these 12 weeks. Or if you get paid monthly, maybe you do it for three months. How, how much you do, that's up to you. Where you do, that's up to you. I told you last week, 
that if it were me, and it is me, my decision, our family's decision, is we've just decided that we're going to invest right here in our church. Do you hear what I said? I didn't say we're going to give to our church. I didn't say we're going to tithe to our church. I said we're going to invest in our church. Why? Because every month I see people who are being baptized. I see lives that are being changed. Every week I see kids that are being taught about Jesus. Every week I see teenagers that are connecting with small group leaders. Every week I see teens going out into our community. Every week I see this church doing amazing things to grow the kingdom of God and to help people. And if I tried to do that at the United Way, at the YMCA, and a lot of different places, I'd have to go all over town and I still wouldn't have the confidence that the gospel would be at the middle of it like I know it is here. What am I saying to you? What I'm saying to you is it all begins with an alignment of God is owner, I'm manager. And the way I begin stepping into that with faith is to begin releasing some of the resources that he's given me. God wants you to be able to provide the clothes and the food and all of those things. God wants you to enjoy your life, but not at the expense of the mission that you were born into. So that's my challenge. Twelve weeks, these three months, November, December, January. Man, see if that is a time that God can change things. I'm telling you, I am not pushing you to give that money here. This is not about this church getting money. This is about you and God. You decide as a family. Now, if I look across this room, I want to speak to the husbands. Guys, God has called us to lead. If we're waiting on our wives to, to say, I'm going to give so much money to church and then we're going to get mad about it, we're already out of order. I think God will be so pleased in this church if the men of this church, the, the fathers and the families of this church would have a conversation with our wives and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's talk about how we can, can invest in what God's doing. And men, I'd love for you to invite your wives into that. Not tell them this is what we're going to do, but have a conversation about how does this make sense for us? How can we do this? What do you feel comfortable with? Here's what I feel comfortable with. Here's what I feel like God's telling me. Men, women, husbands, wives, getting together on the same page and honoring what God's doing. You want to fix some broke in your life? You want the secret to financial success? It's aligning yourself with God is the owner and you as the manager, teach your children, honor God, honor your wife, and invest in His kingdom. I'd love to pray with you before we finish. Could you just close your eyes, bow your head right there where you are. I want to talk to you. I want to pray over you as you're making commitments right now. But before I do, man, this, this story that we're talking about is such a story. Yeah, it's got a lot to do with money. But it also has a lot to do with the heart of God and eternity. If you're sitting there right now, and you're hearing all of this, and maybe when I said something about it, if you're not a follower of Christ, something in you resonated. And you know, maybe you've gone to church all of your life, but you've never aligned your life with the teachings of Jesus. You realize that you are creating a world where, where you're trying your best to be your own God. You're making all the decisions. You've never surrendered to Christ. And then there's something that happens in your heart when you hear God saying to you, I love you. I have a plan for you. I want more for you. I can give you a better life than you can get on your own if you'll just trust me. See, what I saw this morning was four ladies who had found themselves in a place where they couldn't manage to get themselves out of the ditch that life had put them in. We talked about this backstage. Every one of us are sinners. Every one of us has managed to get ourselves in a hole that we can't get out of. The difference is, the ladies who stepped into that water today said, God, I surrender my life to you. What about you? What about you? When you think about eternity, when you think about eternity, when you think about your future, when you think about your life, do you have this confidence that you're following Jesus the way He would have you to. If not, today is the day of salvation. In the story Jesus said, He said, tonight your very life will be demanded of you. You know as well as I do, it happens every day. It happened in our congregation this week. What are you going to do with that? My question to you right now is if you don't know or, or let me put it this way. If you do know that I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and today 
I want to trust Him to lead me in the life that He planned for me. I am willing to surrender my life and to begin to follow Jesus. I want to pray for you, but before I pray, would you just raise your hand right now? Hallelujah. There's two hands up front. Need three, four. Who else? Raise your hand. I want Jesus. I want, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. Anybody else this morning? Father God, you see the hands, you see the hearts. Lord, you are speaking to lives this morning. Jesus, you are such a good Lord, such a kind Savior. God, you want good things for us. And you see these this morning, Jesus, who are saying yes to you. You hear their heart, God. God, what they're saying to you is, here's my life. Make me new. Forgive me for my sins. Put my feet on the pathway that leads to your promise. What they're saying, Jesus, is, I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. And I'm asking you to save my soul. Jesus, right now, we honor you, we thank you, because we know that you're doing that very thing. God, for others in this room who are considering what it looks like to align our lives with you, maybe we've been walking with you for a long time. God, today in prayer, we're putting ourselves before you. Some of us in this room are saying, God, I don't have any idea how to make this change. But I'm trusting you. Would you help me, God? Lord, hear those prayers. People who maybe have never given anything, maybe never considered being a generous person. God, would you help them to see what it looks like in their personal, individual lives to invest in your kingdom, the work that you're doing for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.